Hi everyone, this is La Montagnard 89, and this is my Shakespeare-themed channel. On this channel, I plan to post lists of Shakespeare quotes, Shakespeare characters, great scenes, various uh, things, news about Shakespeare, upcoming uh, movies, productions, the like. This is intended to be a general Shakespeare resource channel for fans uh, and uh, you know, actors, directors, everybody who has an interest in Shakespeare for any reason whatsoever, I hope to have something for you on this channel. However, the main thing that I plan to put here during September and October is my uh, blog, you know, my video blog here, about my experience directing Richard II. Auditions start next week and the show will be up in mid-late October. And I plan to share this experience with you on this channel. So. For this first video, before we get into the later ones where we're going to really be delving into this text in a big way, I want to answer the two baseline questions for this production, which will be an all-female production of Richard II. Of course, the, the first question is, why Richard II? And for that, I can say, because I could pick this play apart forever. I really believe that some scenes in this play, the English language should be retired, you know, should have been retired after they were written. It's that good, and I could really just pick it apart forever, which is uh, what you need before you can really sit down to direct something. Uh, this is a school production for those of you who are probably thinking that I'm too young to be a professional director. You're right. It is a school production, but that said, uh, we're very serious about theater here, um, and I'm also um, in the Shakespeare company on campus, so we're, we're pretty serious about Shakespeare, though it is an amateur uh, student uh, venture. The second question is, why an all-female production? And that has both practical and artistic reasons, really. Uh, the first being, the entire canon of Western drama is about 85% male characters, and people really take for granted that there are just more opportunities for guys uh, to act, especially in classical interpretations of these plays. And I really wanted to counteract that. I'm obviously not going to correct that problem single-handedly with one production. But uh, girls can do Shakespeare too, especially a play like Richard II, which for those of you who are not familiar with the play, is a very lyrical, poetic, beautiful language play. It's not a very sexual play, so it's not going to run up against, I think, logistical issues. I don't think anyone in the audience is going to, watching the play, be thinking, gee, it doesn't really work because it's women playing these roles. I picked this play with that idea in mind because I think that it can and will work. I think that it, it just is logistically possible, uh, as well as uh, practically interesting to give this large group of performers a chance to take a crack at some of Shakespeare's heftier roles, uh, which is often... Uh, not afforded to them, uh, that opportunity. Artistic reasons. Richard is a very feminine man. We see a lot of feminine modes that he uses. He's very rhetorical as opposed to action-based, and we see a, a huge contrast with his opponent, Henry Bolingbroke, who's the more active, masculine force of the play. Now, for me, that's a question mark there. Is Henry... Henry is more masculine than Richard, but is he really masculine is does he win the throne ultimately uh spoilers uh does he win the throne ultimately because of this masculinity or perhaps because of this subtlety that he has especially in the first act its ability to to not say exactly what he means it helps him i think quite a lot especially before he's banished in the beginning uh, whereas richard derives his power from his speech obviously that's not quite enough uh, to keep uh, the practical power of the play. And I think that that discrepancy between the two characters, you know, where, where does the rhetoric lie, where does the power lie, and why uh, do these things perhaps not go together, and, and what causes the breakdown of the play, that I think that we can really delve into the personalities and, and what wins out in politics and what doesn't. I think it's a very political play. Uh, you know, one of the few Shakespeare plays that doesn't have a lot to do with sexuality and sex. It has a lot to do with politics. So the other, uh, you know, the second oldest profession, as it were. So that is my baseline uh, pitch to you out there in the YouTube world. Uh, I really hope that you will uh, tag along with me and join me through this experience, as well as other things which uh, will probably be popping up on this channel a little bit after Richard II. It's going to be eating my life a little bit. But uh, going forward, uh, the next video will be about 
the cutting of the script, which I think was, uh, which was a more interesting uh, experience than I thought it was going to be. Uh, and that has been done, and I'd love to just uh, do a video covering that, as well as a general vision for the play design-wise. Uh, I can describe the space that we're putting the play in. And just in general, I hope that uh, you will enjoy uh, traveling with me through this experience of taking this play from the page to the stage. That's an overused expression, but it fits, and I think that's why it's overused. Um, but, you know, page to stage, Richard II edition. Uh, if you, and now I'm going to try in two minutes to sum up Richard II, for those of you coming at this from a more Shakespeare, but less specifically Richard II vibe, my first recommendation to you, read the play. But if you don't want to do that, here is my two minute long, I'm going to watch the clock here, I have a little timer, summary of Richard II. It opens after the murder of the Duke of Gloucester. He was almost definitely killed in the play, in history, not so much, uh, perhaps, but uh, he was he was very anti-Richard. So the, uh, the anti-Richard partisans are very upset. They think that Richard put out a hit on him and through the Duke of Mowbray had him killed. Mowbray is accused specifically of doing this by Henry Bolingbroke. Uh, both men are very dangerous. Mowbray, Mowbray, because he possibly knows too much about Richard's plans. Henry, because He's being an instigator. He wants to crack this all open. Richard gets nervous, exiles them both. Bolingbroke's father, John Gaunt, dies, and Richard, to pay for his court and his wars, confiscates John Gaunt's estate. This is a problem because Bolingbroke was not banished for life, but only for six years. So when he comes back, he's going to be sans title and, and revenue, and that's a problem for him. So he decides to not wait out of six years. He's been wronged in his mind, and a lot of nobles believe that he's rightfully angry about this. He comes back with an army, and Richard realizes what's really happening, which is he has lost the legitimacy that he thought he had, and perhaps he never really did. And he starts understanding the depth of what's wrong with his uh, assumptions of his own divinity, things like that. And it becomes less plot-based at this point and much more about the language, and Richard just sings his way to death. He gives up the crown to Bolingbroke. He's imprisoned. Henry uh, has him killed. So that is ultimately how it ends, and it ends with Henry questioning his own legitimacy as king because of what he had to do uh, to get to the crown, and he's trying to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land at the end, but if you know the Henry IV plays, you know how successful he is about that. So there we go, two-minute summary of Richard II, and I hope that we can share this experience, and I hope you have just as much fun with it as I do. I'll be back with the uh, script cutting slash general vision of the play in the next video. And after that, we are on to auditions. And this is wheels up, baby. All the way, page to stage. Let's do this.